Well, good morning. I want to welcome you to our time together online this morning. I really wish we could all be in our church building today, but unfortunately, due to the current restrictions with this two-week lockdown, that's not going to be possible. But I am thankful that we can still spend time together around God's Word in this way, and I do hope that you'll be blessed and encouraged by it. Let me begin by reading a passage from God's Word, and hopefully this will help us to focus our thoughts just as we prepare to worship the Lord. It's from Hebrews chapter 1, and it's just the first four verses. And it says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. You know, we can give thanks how God has spoken to us, how he's not only revealed himself through his creation, through his word, but also through his son as well. And this reminds us the, of the redemption that he brought even through the cross. And we're going to listen to a hymn that reminds us of that. And it's based upon that well-known chorus, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. And it's sung for us here by Jonathan, Oliver and Theo Ray, who recorded this a little while ago for us. This is Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Every knee will bow, every tongue 
Well, yesterday was the Baptist Church's Council, but due to present restrictions, this had to be held over Zoom. And that was the first time that had happened. And I do think it would be good for us to pray for association of churches and also our, our association director. And we had been praying for Margaret Thompson as well and Pastor uh, Jonathan Ray uh, from Glen Gormley Baptist who was in hospital and we can give thanks to God that both of them are now back home. So uh, let's come before the Lord and let's give thanks and let's pray for these folks as well. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you, Lord, even that we can come here, Lord, and just pray in this way that we can even meet online and we want to give you thanks even for just the opportunity that that gives us. Father, we want to give you thanks even as this passage that we read a little while ago reminds us of how you have revealed yourself, how you have revealed yourself through your Son and Father for the price that he paid for our sins and that he is seated now at your right hand and that he ever lives to make intercession for us. And Father, just help us today as we consider our Saviour. And Lord, we do ask that, we, we do want to thank you also for how you hear and you answer our prayers. Father, for how uh, you've answered that prayer even for Margaret and for, for Johnny, that he's, they're both out of hospital, Lord. We want to give you thanks for that answered prayer. And Father, we do pray that you'll help them both, Lord, even in their, their recovery. Father, give them that strength that they need. Continue to, to heal them, Lord. And Father, just we pray for their families, Lord, as well as, you, as they care for them. And Lord, we do want to also thank you for the Association of Churches even that met yesterday. We want to give you thanks for that fellowship that we share in Christ Jesus. And as we heard of all the, the good news, Lord, of even the, just the other opportunities, Lord, even opening up uh, of the work in, in France as well too. And Father, even of new churches even being added to our association as well. We want to pray for the North Belfast uh, Christian Fellowship as it was added to the association. And Father, to hear even of others from the South even uh, applying to be added, we do want to give you thanks for that. And Father, we do pray for our director, Dave Ramsey, as he seeks to try and support and help our churches uh, just amidst these difficult times. Father, we are mindful of those today also who, who find themselves now preaching online. And, and these are very difficult circumstances. And we do pray, Lord, for, for all those even who are preaching online today and for those churches in the South who have been in this situation even for a number of months now. Lord, please help them. We pray for all who would listen as well. And Lord, bless us today as we meet around your word. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's just a few announcements today. And the first one is to remind you about our midweek prayer and Bible study when we'll be continuing our series on the armour of God. So that meeting is going to be in Zoom. And so you're going to need a link to join that prayer meeting. So I'll be sending this out to our church lockdown WhatsApp group. And if you're not on WhatsApp, uh, I can email you that link instead. So that's still at our usual time of 7.30 on Wednesday night. And I'd ask you to join just a little bit before 7.30 just to let us get set up and get everything all working there okay. But then our next time together is going to be next Sunday morning once again on YouTube at 11 o'clock. So that will be going live at that time. But there's also an event, an additional event on this week for the men. And that's on this Thursday evening from 8 o'clock to quarter past nine. And the theme is being godly men in the pandemic and beyond. And this is available through our association. You can watch it to go. You need to go to the link irishbaptist.org forward slash YouTube. So that's the link where you can actually watch that video on Thursday night at eight o'clock. And again, it might be a good idea just to tune in a little bit before it, just before that starts. And featured in this is an interview with Kent Hughes. That's the man who wrote the book, Disciplines for a Godly Man. And he was supposed to be the guest speaker at the 125th anniversary night of the association in October. But sadly, that had to be postponed. So this promises to be an excellent night. So men, can I encourage you to watch that on Thursday evening at 8 o'clock. But before we turn to God's word now, we're going to listen to another hymn. And this is one we played a little bit of a few weeks ago. And it has such beautiful words inspired by Romans 5.20, which says, Where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. And this hymn is Grace Greater Than Our Sin. <laughs>
if you have your Bible with you, can I encourage you to turn to Matthew's Gospel today. We're almost at the start of December and so I'd like to seek to prepare our own hearts for this Christmas period. And to do that, we're going to read from Matthew chapter 1 today. We're just going to read the first 17 verses. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Amminadab, and Amminadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. David the king begot Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon begot Rehoboam, and Rehoboam begot Abijah, and Abijah begot Asa. Asa begot Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat begot Joram, and Joram begot Uzziah. Uzziah begot Jotham, Jotham begot Ahaz, and Ahaz begot Hezekiah. Hezekiah begot Manasseh, Manasseh begot Amon, and Amon begot Josiah. Josiah begot Jeconiah and his brothers about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Babylon Jeconiah begot Shealtiel, and Shealtiel begot Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel begot Abiad, and Abiad begot Eliakim, and Eliakim begot Azor. Azor begot Zadok, and Zadok begot Achim, and Achim begot Eliad. Eliad begot Eliezer, Eliezer begot Mathan, and Mathan begot Jacob. And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. And from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. And this is the word of God. You know, if you follow a daily reading scheme, Perhaps sometimes you reach passage such as, passages such as the one we've had today and maybe you find yourself with this temptation to skip over them. They maybe contain a lot of names that are either hard to pronounce or maybe even some you're not familiar with. But today I want to encourage you not to do that, to not skip over these passages because these are part of the word of God and they are included in God's word for a reason. They too have something to teach us. Matthew begins by telling us that this is the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. He's not meaning that the whole book is about a family genealogy, but the words he uses in Greek biblios, as translated as book, can refer to an entire book, but it can refer to a writing or a record. The next word translated genealogy is genosis, which is where we get our word uh, genesis from which is, of course, a book of beginnings. So what we have here in this opening section of this book is a record of the origin or the beginning of the ancestry of Jesus. Now, you might wonder, Matthew, why you start your gospel that way? Why you start with a record? And why maybe not start with a story that might be more catching or might draw people in? Why you start with a genealogy? Now, to us, while genealogies might not make a big impact on us, if you were from a Jewish background, these were extremely important. They were extremely important in order to prove that someone was truly one of God's people. Genealogies established their inheritance, or sorry, their heritage, their right to inheritance and even legitimacy as well. So what I'd like to do is to take this genealogy and I want to draw some attention, your attention to some things about it. Some things which I think are really helpful for us to understand the purpose even of this being included. The first thing I want you to pay careful attention to is to how this genealogy begins and ends. It begins and ends with Christ. Look carefully at verse 1. This is more an introduction really in verse 1, but you know we sometimes are tempted to skip over introductions, aren't we? But we shouldn't because often writers of the, the letters and the Gospels in their opening verses actually do introduce some interesting major themes or emphasis of their Gospels or letters. So they're actually giving something away in these that they want us to pay attention to. 
And in Matthew's in, in verse 1, he says not only is this the record of Jesus, but also he uses different titles alongside Jesus' name. And these are going to be important in how we understand this record. So pay attention to the titles of Jesus used in verse 1. Firstly, he gives Jesus, the, he calls Jesus with his full title of Christ. Jesus was his personal name. In Hebrew, it means the Lord is salvation or Yahweh saves. But then it's followed by the word Christ. And that's not a second name. That's not a surname or anything. No, that's Christ is a title, which means anointed one. Now, when someone was anointed, this was to set them apart for some special kind of service. For example, high priests were anointed, as were kings. But Jesus is God's anointed one, the one set apart and chosen for a special work. And this was a work that he was anointed to do. And this work was to be God's saviour, the one who God had promised long before. You see, this word Christ is a, a Greek translation of the Hebrew word Messiah. And we'll see how Matthew draws out this meaning even in these next two titles. Because Jesus is also referred to here in verse 1 as the son of David. The son of David. He's referred to in this way because he's going to feature this. And this is something that Matthew is actually going to use this title a number of times in this gospel. He's going to draw our attention to that a number of occasions. But as you know, David was one of the most uh, famous and revered kings in Israel's history. He was the man who was described as one after, a man who was after God's own heart. But yet, God made an important promise to David. He promised that from his line would come one who would establish a kingdom. And that that kingdom that would be established would endure forever. And so, Matthew is going to show his readers. Jesus is a fulfilment of these promises made to David long ago. But not just the promises made to David. Look at the next title given in verse 1. He's also referred to as the son of Abraham. God had made a covenant with Abraham as well. And he promised the whole world that would be blessed through his line. And here Matthew links this promise with Jesus. So what he's doing here in these opening verses is he's showing us that Jesus fulfilled the hopes of the promises and prophecies made to Israel. But more than that, these titles not only speak of blessing to Israel, but the promise even made to Abraham indicated that through his chosen one, God would bring blessing to the Gentiles as well. And as the truth of the carol declares, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. So even in these introductory verses, Matthew's telling us something very important. That Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one. He is the son of David. In other words, he's that promised one that was given that promise to David long before. He's also the one that was promised to Abraham even long before that. The means through even which those promises are going to be fulfilled. But what about the, their genealogy itself as we come to it in verse 2? Well, actually, as you pay close attention to it, there are a number of surprising things in this. I don't know if you've ever watched uh, that show, Who Do You Think You Are? Uh, at least I think that's what the title of it's called. But basically, that's where they take a, a well-known celebrity and they often uh, delve back into their family history. And uh, there's, there's sometimes they find some pleasant surprises in their family history as they trace their family tree. But sometimes they can find some shocking surprises as well. And what we see here is this is not just your typical genealogy. In this, and as you look down this uh, list of names, Matthew actually shows us the sweep of Jewish history. From Abraham and his generations to the time of the kings, to the time of the exile in Babylon, right to the return of the people, even to the years when the voices of the prophets fell silent. But if you were to compare this record with another typical Jewish record, the first thing you would notice is that there are actually some unusual additions which you wouldn't normally see. So that's something else we see here. There's some surprising additions. After reading verse 2 of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, you come across actually the first surprise in verse 3. The mention of Tamar. Now normally women aren't mentioned in genealogy such as this. In fact the lineage uh, in Jewish genealogies is usually traced through men as the head of the family. 
But actually, as you keep on reading, you'll not just see one woman, but actually five women mentioned in this. There's Rahab and Ruth mentioned in verse 5. Also Bathsheba is referred to, uh, although not named in verse 6, but uh, as is Mary in verse 16. So all these women, it's interesting that these are referred to here. But also some of these women are not Jews at all. Some of them are Gentiles. Tamar was likely a Canaanite, as was Rahab. And Ruth was a, a Moabitess. So it's highly unusual actually to have them here. But not only that, there are some awkward inclusions. You see, some people, maybe if they were trying to write um, a, a glossy biography, they would perhaps might gloss over some characters, maybe that if they were tracing back to someone's history or ancestry and they find maybe some awkward inclusions, maybe they wouldn't want to add them in. But Matthew doesn't do that here. He actually includes them as well. Even those characters with perhaps some shady pasts. So let's go back to those women that we just talked about there. Tamar was a woman who, she had a shady past as well. She enticed her father-in-law into an incestuous relationship. Rahab also was a prostitute. And, but she was a woman who also witnessed the power of God. She'd seen God working through the Israelites. She was a woman who had witnessed the very power of God and she saved the Israelite spies. And then there's Bathsheba, referred to here as the wife of Uriah the Hittite, reminding us of David's sin, as they had a child together and as David initially had tried to cover it up before he repented of his sin and sought God's forgiveness. But what about some of those kings who were mentioned as well. Not only did some of the, the women have a, a somewhat shady past here mentioned there, but what about some of the kings who were mentioned? Well, there was good kings mentioned like Asa, Jehoshaphat, uh, Uzziah, Hezekiah, and Josiah. But there was other kings mentioned there which weren't so good. Kings like Rehoboam, he was a wicked king, and his son Abijah wasn't much better. And there are many others like that too. And in the latter list of kings, from the generations from David to Jehoiakim, there was a clear moral decline. And that gloom, though, wasn't going to last forever. Because remember that what that hymn reminded us of, where sin increased, God's grace would abound all the more. You know, if we were compiling a biography and a historical record, we maybe would have left out some of those names. Maybe if people had an embarrassing past or a difficult past, they might have been tempted to gloss over it. But Matthew includes them. Why? Because it doesn't show us the very depths of our Saviour's humbling. Jesus was one who humbled himself. He humbled himself on the cross. Yes, we know that. But he humbled himself even when he came from the highest position. He is the Son of God. And the Son of God came to this broken world of sinners too. Even through a line of sinners as well. And some of his ancestors had this difficult past even as well too. But in this list of names, it reminds us of those who Jesus came to save. He came for both good and bad. All need Jesus. But there's some surprising additions in the record, but there's somewhat awkward inclusions. But there's an even more important emphasis. Look at verse 16 and 17. This is how the genealogy ends. It ends with Jesus. And there's a difference there because it says Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. So notice it didn't say Joseph begot Jesus, because he didn't. Mary conceived through the Holy Spirit coming upon her. That's why it says Mary, of whom was born Jesus. His birth was going to be under different circumstances than the rest there. That's something Matthew wants to draw our attention to. In Galatians 4.4 4, we read that when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. It's something Matthew states here when he says, Mary of whom was born Jesus. And this Greek word of whom is written in the feminine form here. See, people at the time were well aware that there was something unusual about the birth of Jesus. Some perhaps who doubted the virgin birth, perhaps talked about the circumstances of his birth. That he was born to a woman who was not yet married, she had been, was betrothed. Some even likely maybe tried to suggest that he was an illegitimate child. Yet Matthew in his gospel wants the people to see the, the, the legitimacy of his line of birth. 
And he wants us to see very clearly and them to see very clearly this links with the line of David and with Abraham. You see, the writer draws our attention to something else in this very last verse. He wants us to note the structure of the genealogy. This is actually structured in three parts. There's the generations from Abraham to David, and that makes up 14 generations. But then he points out how it divides up between the time of David and the time of the captivity in Babylon. After Solomon, we know David's son, the kingdom was, was split and the people were taken into exile. And that makes another 14 generations. And then the time from the captivity until Christ are 14 generations. Now why this emphasis on, on 14? There's something we do know is that when we compare the, this account with that of Kings and Chronicles, we find out Matthew has actually skipped over some generations. But that's not unusual in a genealogy because they won't often mention every person, but rather significant ones. But of course, Matthew mentions others we might not expect him to mention. So there's nothing to be concerned about there. Also, uh, we might expect Matthew then to emphasize ones he want to, wants to emphasize. And of course, bear in mind, Matthew doesn't just write this of his own volition as well too. Because Peter reminds us that the writers of the Holy Scriptures spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. They, they were moved by the Holy Spirit to write these things. So this emphasis in 14 is even deliberate. But why this? Some, a number of commentators have noticed the significance of how in the Hebrew language, the letters of the alphabet could also be used for numbers. So a Hebrew word then can have a particular numerical value. And what's particularly interesting is that David's name in Hebrew actually has three letters. So in Hebrew, uh, these three letters are the fourth, the sixth, and the fourth letters. Now, if you're very quick with your mouths this morning, you'll realize that that all adds up to 14. David's name, numerically valued as 14. He's actually the 14th member in the list from Abraham to Christ. And Mark Knott Ross notes in his commentary that perhaps this threefold repetition of 14 in this genealogy, Matthew's almost shouting to us, David, David, David. He's showing us again and again that Jesus is the fulfillment of these promises even made to David. He is the greater king. The structure of these three groups of 14 is to make these names stand out particularly. The names of Abraham it begins with, the name of David even in the middle, the name of Jesus at the end, this 14 showing out. Once again showing us how God fulfilled these promises. Jesus was the one who fulfilled those prophecies made to Abraham and also David. But as we finish today, what lessons can we learn from this genealogy? What can we take away from it? Well, these names are included as a testimony to the grace of God. This is a testimony of God's grace. You know, in this list, we have people who are involved in immorality in this list. We have others who were wicked kings, but all needed God's grace, both the wicked and the moral, as well as the good and the upright. Paul reminded us in Romans 3 that there is no difference for all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. All need to be justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. He reminds that for all the people in this genealogy, whether good or bad, famous or infamous, Jesus came to save people just like this. So at the very beginning of this gospel, God's grace is emphasised. His gospel, as it progresses, he's going to show us how that grace is accomplished through Jesus. But there's a second th lesson this has to teach us. And this is a reminder that this was good news that all people need to hear. This genealogy reminds us the news of Jesus coming is good news for all, both for men and women, but also for Jew and Gentile alike. In this list, Ruth was a Moabitess. The Moabites and their descendants weren't allowed to come into the assembly of the Lord. Then there was Rahab, a Canaanite. Yet Christ Jesus was coming to be the saviour of the world. And this world today all need to know of Jesus. And then it finishes with this witness of Jesus' uniqueness. See, this passage reminds us Jesus was not like the others in the list of people. His birth was different. It wasn't like the rest. But that's not the only way he was different. All the names in that list were sinners, whether they had a good reputation or bad. But Jesus was one who was without sin. He had to be like that in order to be our saviour. He had to be that sinless, spotless, 
sacrifice in order to be that saviour. And as I was reminding you the other night from 2 Corinthians 5.21, for he, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus, the sinless one, died for your sin and mine. As we close, you know, throughout this people, throughout this period we've read about even in this list of names, the people were eagerly looking for their Messiah. When each king came along, they wondered, would this be the one? Is this God's chosen one? The Jews prayed often in the temple that God's Messiah would come. Their hopes were likely built up and then shattered every time each king came and went. But their hopes were realised in Christ. But the tragedy is though that though they had anticipated him, when he came, many of his people actually rejected him. It was they who missed out on the salvation that God offered through his precious son, Jesus. But I don't want you to be in the dark about who Jesus is today. He is the son of God. He is the fulfillment of those promises made long before in the Old Testament. He is the one who is the saviour of the world, the one who was sent to bear our sin and the one who will reconcile us to God. The longed for Messiah had come. And so Matthew writes this careful, detailed account that we may know these things are fulfilled in Christ and that we may believe in him. But will you do that today? God keeps his word. He keeps his promises. That's what this also declares to us. And this passage today reminded us all about the generations that waited long for that promise of the Messiah, a promise which, of course, was fulfilled in Christ's coming. And so we're going to close today by singing a hymn and then after that I'll pray. But this next hymn is all about that expectation that the people felt. This is, Come Thy Long Expected Jesus.
Let's close our time together in prayer today. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks, Lord, for the demonstration of your grace, even throughout this gene- genealogy, and how it, Lord, displays your mercy and kindness, and also your great sovereignty and providence as well. We want to give thanks for how it also displays your righteous character and faithfulness in keeping your promises, both to David and also to Abraham. And so, Heavenly Father, we want to give you thanks that in the midst of these difficult days, we have wonderful good news to declare. Good news about the Saviour, Christ Jesus, who came into this world to pay the price for sin. And so, Father, help us as we declare this in this Christmas period and help us to remember that he came to be that light even into this darkened world. And so, Father, encourage us with that and bless us and help us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.